Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Eric Touch of Touch Knives. Touch Knives is a father-son team that creates some of the most intricate, artful, luxurious modern folders that I've handled. They feature exotic materials, painstaking builds, and next-level action, whether automatic or not. Uh, I had the chance to handle the five or so lottery knives they brought to Blade Show this year and really look forward to finding out from Eric how these things are made and how it all got started. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show. Uh, that's a great way to, to help out the show. And you can also download it to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show monetarily, you can do so by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Eric, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. It's good to have you. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Congratulations on a successful Blade Show 2023. Yeah, I appreciate that. So uh, tell me <laughs> how it went. Uh, I met you there and had a chance to see your hand, uh, see your work firsthand uh, after following it on Instagram for, for some time. Uh, tell me how the show went. Yeah, it went really well. Um, it's always fun to to go and, and and catch up with old friends and and put faces and names from people that we have interacted with over social media over the years. And you know, you, sometimes you meet someone and you're like, oh, you're not what I expected at all, but awesome guy. Like, yeah, it was really cool. I got to connect with a lot of uh, different different people, different makers that, you know, I've, I've met in the past, um, but I've, you know, was able to have uh, more in-depth conversations. I got to um, hang out with Ken Onion, had a couple really good talks with him, which was, which was really cool. Um, but the shows, you know, they're not really for any maker. I tell you, it's not really for selling the knives. We can, we can sell knives on, you know, through, through other means. It's more about coming, connecting, networking, um, you know, meeting people and uh just yeah making connections uh what do you think of the the group of people assembled the group of people <laughs> the massive room of yeah anything you could possibly think of it's a lot to take in yeah it is every year i definitely i mean regardless of the amount of you know effort and 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 time that goes into just getting ready for the shows um you know going setting up we're in a booth now so uh you know, getting getting that set up is a little bit more effort there. The steps you put in, the you know, walking on concrete floors for three days straight, being up late and 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 hanging out, and then waking up next morning and spending another eight ten hours in a in a showroom. It's 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 definitely takes a toll on you after a while. Well, I was thinking about uh, the difference between being uh, someone who's there as a visitor and you're just kind of swimming around like a shark the whole time, going down the rows, looking at everything and then going room to room and coming back. And then there are the people who are exhibiting, such as yourself, who are in one spot. You're like a reef animal, you know, kind of moored to one spot and you get to see everyone going by. Um, right. I, either way, it's a it's a pretty great way to meet uh, like minded people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, touch knives. Um, the logo. I want to. I want to talk about the logo as a way of getting into uh, what touch knives is. It is a. Uh, it's a beautiful logo. It's a. It's behind you on the wall. It's a, a man holding a young boy's hand. Uh, tell us about touch knives. How it got started and how you got into this. Well, speaking of the logo, that's actually uh, based, I should have brought the photo to show you, but that's a, a photo of my dad and I, um, which I actually have tattooed on my back. It was the first tattoo that I ever got. Um, and then I just got on, you know, I, I had a number of talks with different people that gave advice on how to brand, how to, you know, really tell your story. And I felt like this was the most authentic way to, to do so, to really represent what Touch Knives is. It's a father-son business. I've learned you know, my dad's been doing it for 20 years i've been in the shop for the last 10 learning everything from him and there's there's nothing i can't do at this point so we just work side by side 
I've got my side projects, you know, like the, the giveaway knife we'll get into. That's one of my own uh, personal designs and, um, you know, something, something that I, I like to go off and, and do and try to, um, you know, expand my, push my limits on, on the things that I can build. Because I started, you know, when I came into the shop, uh, my dad was just in the art knife world. He had originally um, learned from Butch Valentin, so he, he was originally a, a switchblades guy. He learned automatics and um, assisted openers, different dual actions, the button, the scale release. Um, and now we're working on uh, a scale release that, ha you know, that concept has been done before, but about four or five years ago now, my dad took the time. He had a you know light bulb moment and re-engineered it to the point that it was something totally original to the point that we actually have a patent for the mechanism that we use. That's pretty cool. That's the one that I had a chance uh, to check out at Blade Show, right? The scale release right. Um, automatics. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, my dad spent a number of years just doing automatics, first few years, and then he uh, made friends with uh, a very prominent, well-known art knife maker named Tim Herman. Mm -hmm. And Tim Herman has... Man, if, if you look up his work, he's just unbelievable. He he brought in um, so many different techniques. Him and Wolfgang Lorschner uh, worked together, kind of collaborated. He taught Wolfgang how to make lockbacks. Wolf sort of taught, taught Tim Herman how to do the fluting, the carving, which is all done with just files and sandpaper. Oh. And then my dad was fortunate enough to learn both of those things from my dad, uh, from, from Tim. And uh, then he spent a number of years just in the art knife world. So when I came in, that's that's all he was doing, just old school taper pin lockbacks, inlay, carving, just real intricate things with you know hundreds of hours um, into them. Eventually, we kind of realized that that wasn't a, a good way to make a living you know not a very practical way to make a living when you're putting hundreds of hours into a single piece mm -hmm. and then by the time you're ready to to sell it you know you've got bills stacked and then sometimes you'll uh you know have to sell it for less than the time that you actually have into it so we started getting back into more tactical stuff we learned the flippers because that was the big thing the big new thing to do um and then this new mechanism came along. So we started getting back into the automatic. So I've got a very well um, rounded skill set um, that I was fortunate enough to learn from my dad. Uh, that reminds me of the classical education of an artist uh, learning uh, anatomy, learning still life, uh, learning to draw from life. Um, you know, the, the hard stuff, the stuff that, you know, we all want to become an abstract painter, but before you get there, you have to learn how to do the hard stuff and do the real stuff. And uh, in a way, that's kind of what you went through un unwittingly. You kind of did the hardest stuff first, folding yeah. art knives, basically. Yeah, the level of fit and finish with those is just bar none. You know, there's especially the, the level that my dad instilled in me. You know, every, every little thing has to be just right, you know, different different textures, different finishes, everything is finished inside and out. You know, fit, fit and finish is definitely um, the priority when it comes to, to the quality and, and uh, energy that we put into a knife. So when one sets out to make uh, one, uh, one of those knives, let's, let's talk about uh, for a second, maybe some of the knives that you no longer make because they're impractical because you're putting so many hundreds of hours into them. When you're working on a knife like that, do you already have a buyer lined up or is that something that you're doing pretty confident that someone's going to buy it because your work is in demand? Uh, I'd say a little bit of both. Sometimes we'll we'll do it based off an order, but for the most part, at least at that time, we would just make what what called to us, what was in our mind's eye, and and um, yeah, just kind of hope that someone would appreciate it and buy it <laughs> and support what we do. And so, how did your how did your dad first get started? I know he, uh, as you said, he trained with Butch uh, Velotin, uh early on, uh, but what what where was he coming from? Uh, had is your family kind of an outdoorsy family? Do you come from a, a knife family? Well, that was actually kind of a fluke. Um, 
I, we are we do come from the the metal industry in the first couple of, i'm i'm the fourth generation in the metal industry in my family huh. for the couple being on the supply side of things um and he you know worked in the family business and then also uh, when i was growing up he had a fabrication shop um but we had moved to to up to portland my mom found a good job um, as a computer programmer so he was kind of just being um you know mr mom for a while and uh, at one point, his knife was actually stolen out of his um, his car. And so, as an anniversary present idea, my mom suggested he finds a knife, nice knife to to replace. And my dad did his research. He came across the company, both Valets and Knives, and called up the guy to make an order, thinking it's it's going to be the company, but it was Butch. Hello, this is Butch. And after they talked for a while, they realized they had had some mutual friends, mutual connections. Um, He asked, when's my knife going to be ready? And and Butch told him, when are you going to be down here to build it? Because he was a couple hours south of Portland. And so he spent a few months in Butch's shop. And then um, after he had made his first few, they went to the Oregon, uh, what is it called? One of of the Oregon shows down uh, down in Eugene and sold his knives and asked Butch, what do I do next? And Butch said, go home and make a shop, get out of mine. (laughs) So the rest is kind of history. Okay. So you said that you've been, um, uh, you around it your whole life, but you've been working, uh, in the shop and making knives, uh, obviously progressively, uh, more and more, uh, over the last 10 years, how did it start? Uh, how old were you and, 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 or how, you know, what kind of responsibilities were you given and how did it evolve for you? Well, I started, um, I was going to school in Canada. Uh, I was going to school for kinesiology. I wanted to do physical therapy and my parents pushed me for a more practical path. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't thriving in that situation. I realized I wasn't, you know, that's, that's not where I wanted to be. And, uh, I felt like it was a better idea to to learn a skill, and I really didn't have the desire or or idea that I was going to end up in the knife shop with my dad. Um, I was, you know, at that time I did roofing, con- different contracting. I was going to start an electrician a- apprenticeship, um, but at one point, the, I think the real catalyst of it, my dad was actually in a car accident. He got T-boned. And ended up with some nerve damage in his arm, and he was he was struggling to um, keep up with his work. And so I decided I was going to jump in the shop with him and try to pick up the slack a little bit. Which, granted, it took a couple of years for me to really, you know, become an asset rather than a liability in the shop, you know, making my fair share of mistakes and stacking up, you know, a good little scrap pile of material. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just kind of jumped in with both feet and, and learned as quick as I could and eventually just developed my own passion for it and just kept on going. So when you're, when you're doing that, well, I, I guess every situation is different, but I always imagine that it's very difficult for a maker such as your father, uh, to, um, I mean, you really have to know that person. Well, luckily you're his son he knows you well. Um, but but to to know when to hand over a little bit more a little bit more responsibility with this knife because everything you're working on is so unique and um, expensive given the materials um, that's got to be a, a, a fine line to walk and like you said you I guess you do end up with a stack of kind of valuable junk yeah yeah definitely um, let's see uh, well. <laughs> Where are we going here? Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. <laughs> Quite all right. Yeah. It's so, it, um, as you're kind of gaining experience in the shop, when is it that you uh, start building your own knives? Because you're working on your dad's work, right? You're learning how to make knives your dad's way, and you're learning to make your dad's models. Is that correct? Yeah, essentially. Um, there was, I mean, the, I also was um, being pushed to, to build my own and, and to use the skills that he was teaching me to, um, to do that. But yeah, for the for the first majority of the start of the years that I've been doing it, I was we were just working totally together. I would designed one um, called the Chantrell, which is a intricate art knife based off of 
the chanterelle mushroom that I um, would go forage for in the Pacific Northwest Hills here, um, which just has beautiful lines. And so that was a knife that I had designed and then started building on my own. But then he kind of saw the potential of it and said, hey, I'll you know help you finish this one off. And that actually ended up uh, winning best art knife at Blade Show. I can't, I'm not sure which year that was, but oh, that's cool. Um, and then it also ended up on the the cover of the largest blade magazine in China, uh, which led to being invited to Beijing for a, a knife show, which was really cool. Wow. So uh, how how did it grow? Uh, this is one way, obviously, uh, but have, is it going to Blade Show? Is it meeting people like that and? Or, or, or are there networks of high end? Well, first of all, actually, before we even get to that, tell us kind of what the what what the philosophy of your knives are, what uh, what the philosophy of touch knives are, um, because without actually looking at them and seeing how beautiful, intricate, even the insides of them are and then how how nicely they open with those with the mechanism and everything. What What is the uh, kind of the underlining <laughs> underlying design philosophy of touch knives well design philosophy can go one way you know finding lines balance um everything works together it obviously has to function properly especially with folding knives you have to um, create proper geometry so it actually works works right um but i would say the biggest motto in our shop that i've learned is no mistakes just new designs you know, if something happens, well, you know, especially in the handmade world, you know, everything is one of a kind. If something happens here, then you know, make a little bit of adjustment here, you know, adjust accordingly. And that has led to some really, really cool knives that were essentially unintentional. <laughs> well, that's a that that's a uh, that's an approach that uh, an artist will take, Uh Whereas uh, an engineer might not be as um, as uh, open to that kind of thing, the beauty and imperfection. I, I don't remember what the word is, but it's a Japanese term uh, in you know art. The beauty and imperfection. Something happens. Like you don't want a clay pot that's perfect. You want a clay pot that has some sort of um, imperfection to it. Otherwise, it's got no character. Right. The cracks filled with gold and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's real beautiful philosophy for sure. So how do you design these things? And and we're going to get to how you actually build them, which is kind of astonishing. You got into it a little bit when we were talking at Blade. But do you and your father and or your father, you sit down with, with pencil and paper? I, I can't imagine you wing it. Uh, I'd say we have a little bit of a different process. My dad's always been very particular about, you know, he, he does have that sort of engineering um you know, mindset of he wants to have a plan. So he, he spends a lot of time on the computer. He puts things in AutoCAD, makes sure everything is going to fit up just right here and there, make sure the lines are right. So he has an idea of where he's going. Uh, most of the de designs that I've personally come up with have actually just kind of been um, just just a, a, a product of a, just a flow state of, of taking a piece of metal and grinding it to, to a shape and finding lines that I like, something that fits in the hand. It generally starts for me with the shape of the handle and then the blade um, comes as a, as a means of what fits right with that handle. Flow state, like a, like a sculptor, you're, you're approaching the grinder with a piece of metal and you're removing all the stuff that isn't the knife you want and and that's pretty cool. And yeah, it's it, a matter of, of uh, to to be present, to be just so focused on the tax and task at hand that that you know any sort of thought just really isn't there. You're just really in in the moment. You, go, you were mentioning Japanese philosophy. I think that's that's a big part of pretty much you know not every but like you know there's there's a certain art that comes with the with the Japanese culture, the Zen state, and everything you know the I don't know if you've read like the book of uh, blanking on the title, but it has to do with the Zen, the Zen art, art of archery, I think it's called. Oh, and okay. you know, they're learning how to, you know, they learn the process, they learn the technique, but then the, the real um, trick to it is to release the string without thought. Or just, yeah. And, and when, when you can get to the point where you, after you put in so many hours that you understand what you're doing, you've developed a certain amount of skills set, um, and ability to, to create and at that point um 
when you can tap into just creation to that you know i think most most creatives can can relate to that sort of sentiment where they get so involved in their work that nothing else matters anymore it's just uh, just you and your work yeah uh there's that but then you also need and this this is the uh this is the hard part then you need the discipline to flop over to the left side of your brain to analyze what you've done and to make corrections and i would imagine with something like engineering like you're making you're not just making a pot or a, a uh, painting you're making a, a working tool yeah, uh, that okay. someone's going to spend a lot of money on you you do have to go back i would imagine into that analytical mind uh, you know uh, every so often to to make sure that it's a, a working piece of engineering mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so uh the the process of actually making them now uh, do you have any anything in front of you or, or are they all off with their new owners Oh no! I, I, we actually brought home uh, a couple of the knives that you saw at, at the show. Which, okay. um, like I was saying earlier, like the, the shows aren't necessarily for making knives. You never, or for selling knives, you never really know what what's going to happen in that regard. But um, right. you know, these are the the knives that I'm that I'll show you here in a, in a minute. Like I'm not I'm not worried about them selling. Like they're they're definitely eye catching. They're there's something that you know they'll find a home shortly. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Let's see what we're talking about here. What should um, we get into first? Should we do a one of the automatics or the giveaway knife? Or? Sure. Let's look at the giveaway knife first, uh, right. because uh, you were telling me some things about how you made this that were really hard for me to believe. Okay, so I'll put that a little bit closer, and let's see. All right, so you've got this beautiful damascus steel what now tell us about the handle and the inlay and uh and how you made all of this yeah so this is my uh my coho model the blade is made out of magnoris damascus so we're all stock removal we start with the bars of material that that forgers make uh, as well as um you know other found materials for example this scale material is actually a vintage bakelite um from like world war ii era um, that's been repurposed for this handle um, it's inlaid with gold lip mother of pearl all through it. And it's got in the in the back spacer even and the and the and the pocket clip all through the the pivots, the thumb studs. Beautiful mother of pearl. And that and that bakelite uh I, I remember reading is from a radio cabinet or a, a, a radio box from uh, from the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, military field phone, this one. That is beautiful now is this one of your double action automatics no this one is a, is a broken knife there's no spring in this one broken knife that's uh, what you call it <laughs> yeah uh it has been requested the the prototype for this in a dual action model is actually on the bench right now we just didn't have time to we didn't want to put ourselves in a bad position by pushing to get it ready for blade show um, but that will be finished in the in the near future now, when I handled this knife, I remember looking down into it and seeing, I believe, your signature uh, written on the inside or something. I can't remember. Maybe it says touch knives down there. Yeah, it's our, our maker's mark in there. It's uh... <sighs> Yeah, and the, the whole inside looked beautifully treated, polished, and uh, considered. Um, is, is, that, is that an aspect of it? Just like every single bit of it is... Uh, artfully considered yeah i mean that's the level of, of fit and finish that i think comes from the years spent in the art knife world where every every single surface is finished inside and out the the liners are jeweled everything's hand sanded um you know even even the screws on the inside are polished if it was to be taken apart you know it's it's that sort of level of of quality that we um strive for with with every piece that we make so, oh, wow. So, so even if you're a tinkerer and you decide to um, take down this knife, you'll, you'll see the amazing polished screws on the inside. So um, this, those inlays, you said, you told me that you didn't even use a panograph to do those inlays. Is that right? Yeah, it's a hundred percent handmade. It's old school techniques. It's, it's known as the Ron Lake method. Um, so essentially I'd, I'd take a bar of material and, 
Um, and this, you know, you can have it water jet or laser cut out to the shape that you want. Like my, my dad likes to put things in AutoCAD. So he actually has an idea of what it is. But in this case, I, I took a bar of material and I sketched out the shape that I wanted to, to create for the, the inlay pocket. I did a rough manual mill and then actually hand filed it to shape. Um, and from there you heat treat it. And then that is used placed on top of the um, scale and then using a, a modified end mill. Um, so it's used so that the, the shaft runs along the, the shape of the pocket and essentially creates a router to create that pocket. And then the opposite, the inlay part of it um, is a mold from that actual pocket, oh. um, which is then pressed out, glued to the material. And then the opposite is, is done essentially to, to create the exact same shape. You know, you get, uh, you, you got to take it off that and then take just a, a hair off because it was literally the exact shape. There's no room for even glue to come out. So you have to just finally, finely tune it in so it'll fit in the pocket nicely. So hold, hold, hold that up to the camera real close uh, again, just so we can see the handle. Now, when I held this, I, I ran my fingers all around that and, you know, inspected it. Uh, because it's not an inexpensive knife, let's put it that way. And uh, I wanted to see what what that's all about. And and it's you know you cannot see any gapping. Obviously, you cannot feel anything. And that was all done one hundred percent by hand. That is amazing to me. So, how many times did you mess up learning how to do that? Because it sounds like there are a lot of you know uh, maybe you get to my age, you got to write things down as you go, but like seems like there are a lot of steps and there's a negative and then a positive and you have to like, how long did that take you to figure out? Uh, well, like, you know, since I learned with my dad, I was fortunate enough to have his, um, you know, guidance and, and, mm -hmm. and doing that initially. So it, that kind of took a, a bit of the learning curve out of it, but to go and, and do it on my own is definitely a, a different story. You know, I came out just with an idea in my mind and, and went for it. I actually ended up, replacing the scales and making a whole new pattern because I hadn't accounted for where the pocket clip screws are. Um, so it kind of like went into the holes and I didn't want the, the pressure to be on the mother pearl inlay there. So I actually redid that entire process to, oh. to make it just right. And that's, that's what comes with, with handmade stuff. Sometimes you got to go back and, and spend a bit more time. If you, you know, like I said, no mistakes, just new designs, just got to keep going and make it work just accordingly. Right. It's like uh, typing your term paper back in the day. You messed up a word. You can't just go and insert it. You got to type everything over again after it. Yeah, <laughs> but you're using, a, using a typewriter instead of a computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, before we get to some of the other designs, uh, tell us about this giveaway and 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 what, what the meaning is behind it. And uh, it's pretty extravagant, I got to say. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, this idea, it came originally from a common occurrence that would happen at shows or interacting on social media with people that really appreciate the work that we do, but it's just not gonna, it's not in the cards for them to afford a two, three, four plus thousand dollar knife. This one here, I'd, you know, the amount of time that I have in it, I'd probably um, have a table price of around five grand for it. Um, and that's, that's solely based off just time and materials. So you know, we, we would sometimes, you know, it would kind of be a jokingly thing where we'd say, yeah, I wish we, I could just give it to you. But that was that was a genuine thing. And and uh, at a certain point, this this project has actually been in the works for about four years now. I started seeing um, people doing a similar concept of what I'm doing now with cars uh, or houses or things. Uh, this massive giveaways here that are that are accruing, you know, millions of dollars in revenue, I'm sure, to make it worth it. And I'm just trying to do it on a much smaller scale. So it, it accomplishes a few things. One, I'm able to, you know, help change someone's life, be able to give back. You know, I've, I've heard people say, people have entered and say, hey, like, I need to replace my roof and I have no idea how I'm going to do it. So fingers crossed. Or, you know, if I won, uh, you know, I'm just going to give it to charity or I don't expect to win, but I want to contribute because I know it potentially helps someone else which is exactly the sort of energy that I want to bring into the world. Um, and on the other side of it, there is, you know, a, a bit of an ulterior motive because if it works properly, 
um, it'll free me up. It'll, it'll give me the creative freedom to really put in as many hours as I want into a single piece and, and push my limits as a, as a maker and as, as an artist um, without worrying about how much time or how much money I'm going to get out of it. Hmm. So this is something you want to recur. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. that's, that's great. That's why it says number one. That's why it's number one. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, so this seems, uh, this, this might, uh, be part of the answer to this question, but, uh, this is a father son outfit and you are the second generation of that outfit. What do you bring as the younger generation? Um, you know, we know what your father brought. He brought the wisdom and the, the knowledge on how to build this stuff. Um, uh, which you have taken and made your own. What do you bring? Well, I, I bring uh, energy. I bring um, some some uh, help. You know, I, I I do it all at this point. I, I make every every aspect of the knives I'm involved with, and then on top of that, you know, it's one thing to find something that you really love to do, but then um, you got to learn how to actually make a business out of it. And that's something that has been a total new learning curve. And, and, and this whole process of making the website, coming up with graphics, um, you know, the legal side of things, the LLCs, the, the licensing, the legalities, all the things. It's been a, a massive learning curve that has, has been a catalyst for a lot of individual growth. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying something new. I'm trying to, to think out of the box um, and... Uh, Ideally, it'll it'll benefit the, my dad, it'll benefit the people that I care about, the benefit the knife community as a whole and the world as a whole. Um, be able to give back and and create abundance in the world. I think it's exciting to see uh, someone of your generation, younger generation, embrace the, these kind of knives, um, uh, because I could see there being a temptation to follow whatever the current trend is and maybe make. Um, make a quicker, uh, less complicated buck that way. Um, but I like that um, you as the younger generation are still embracing this tradition that's been um, handed down to you. Uh, man, you're, that, that is an amazing thing to, to have in your life so native um, and, and to carry it on. And then, like you said, you bring your energy and, uh, you know, kind of just carrying that art into the future i think that's awesome yeah absolutely i mean coming starting in the art knife world you know it was such a limited level of production and everything that we've done new steps new ventures that we've taken over the years has essentially just been a means to creating more um to increase our production to be able to just like you said to simplify the builds to to be able to get to a point to hit a, a price range that more people can can be a part of um and so the whole idea of this giveaway is to um you know because uh, you know those all all those steps it kind of just became a, a means to the end it, you know it, it took away from the actual art of it and and i feel like this is gonna be uh, this this is a, a a means of being able to get back to that that passion get back to the art of things to to be able to really push our limits and 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 create the things that that we see here and 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 just to be able to make the most spectacular things that we can come up with. Uh, Jim just had your web page up and it had a countdown. Uh, how do people enter to win this? Uh, so there's there's a, a few ways you can do it. Uh, I'm using you know first being. Um, the way this is actually going to uh, be able to continue is um, you go to the website, you pick out a piece of merch. I've, I've worked hard. A lot of it features the, the logo behind me, but I've also commissioned a number of graphic designers to give me different, different designs. And I've created over a hundred different products and we continue to put more and more things um, on the website. Um, so every, every dollar you spend on something uh, on the website, is an entry into winning the knife. Oh. Um, another another way you can do it is because no purchase is necessary to enter um, based off legality issues. And also as a means of um, promotion because that's, that's the biggest hurdle that I've run into now is to actually be able to market something like this. Because the, you know, the giveaways with the cars and things, they have no problem running sponsored ads. 
um, or, you know, having mm-hmm. celebrity spokespeople and, and things like that. But because it's a knife, it's a more difficult thing to do. So if it's not a kitchen knife, I'm going to, you know, my, um, my understanding is that you can't, you can't do that without the risk of having your entire account, you know, shadow banned or just stripped away completely, which would be pretty, uh, yeah, that would not be good. So <laughs> the next way uh, I came up with is is you can go to our Instagram or our Facebook. There's a giveaway graphics, which you can repost to your page mm-hmm. along with, you know, liking and commenting on the post, tagging a few friends. So things can kind of grow organically there. And then that will give you per social media and automatic five entries into into the giveaway. That's great. Well, we'll uh, we'll make sure that we have a link there uh, to your website so uh, people can check that out. Uh, and we can see with the beautiful lighting of the photography of this knife, how beautiful it is. Uh, the one that you were just holding up, um, you know, looked looked good on your camera. But this picture, you know, really, it, does it. It's, I mean, it's difficult to even capture in a video. You know, you oh, saw yeah. it in person and obviously yeah. the lighting in, in the Cobb gallery isn't great, but you can tell in person when you hold it, like the, the amount of fire, the color that's in the, in the inlay, it's just something that can't really be appreciated fully unless you, you have, when you're holding it in your hand. Yeah. I was going to say, and I, I would argue that looking at it is up close is one thing, but also looking at it and also feeling it in your hand at the same time is something else. Uh, do you have any of the automatics uh, close at hand? Yeah, I do. All right. Um, so this is one of the more tactical models that we brought to Blade Show here. Uh, it's featuring uh, a canvas black uh, micarta and a two-tone stone wash blade made out of Magna Cut. So as you can see, you can open it as a manual knife but you can also use the spring. Maybe I can show you the, you see the little, little motion there. Just the yes. scale release. So you just, a, just a slight little movement of the handle and that releases the spring there. So you're sliding, sliding that scale up by the pivot um, as if you're trying to slide the scale off of the, off of the entire knife and it rockets open. So have have you seen um, a, a, a change and uptick in orders for these in the past few years since uh, Knife Rights has done so much work in making automatics um, more legal in more places? Um, well, I think it's still a matter of just because of the, the you know, level of, of knives that we make, the it, it essentially just comes, you know, there's a limited supply of people that are, that are buying knives that are, you know, in, the, in this price range, we have um, worked with uh, Best Sec to create our first production model, which we just sold out of at Blade Show. I'm not sure exactly when that'll happen again, or if we're going to be going with a different company next time. Um, but it was really cool to have uh, a model that in the you know, three hundred dollar price range that could put this sort of mechanism in in people's hands that they can't generally uh afford the, the sort of knives that we that we usually make that uh that kind of mechanism you know we've seen it a little bit um protec does one i used to have a microtech that did that it's it's uh it can be a really cool and thrilling uh, and confusing way uh to you know confusing to your friends to open up a knife uh how did the automatic thing was this was this butch uh Volatin's, I'm sorry. I'm, I think I mispronounced his name, but was this I, his? Uh, Valentin, but I've heard Valentin too. I'm not. You know, I'm sure it's like a touch to tuck type of thing that gets right. a little bit. So was that his influence? Uh, the automatics and and what's it like learning how to do all these different mechanisms? It's got to be a. a it's got to add a, so much more difficulty to the build. Yeah, obviously a lot of a lot of influence from Butch there. Um, and like you said, you've seen different uh, versions of the scale release, bolster release, um, hidden mechanism, dual actions. Um, but this is actually something totally new. My dad just had a had a light bulb moment and figured out a way to re-engineer it to the point that we actually have a patent on it. You know, it's been made, it's been simplified. It's actually stronger. It's easier to produce. Um, another cool thing is it's true true dual action, which means that you can actually take the spring out and it functions perfectly as a manual knife. Huh. Let me see that. Oh, look at that. 
This is one of the cool ones we brought. It's got Mother of Pearl Inlay, Arctic Storm, Fat Carbon Scales. God, that's beautiful. And Damacore Blade here. Yeah. So this is that same. Uh, so you were just holding up a black uh, micarta version with a two-tone um, blade. This is a totally dressed up version of it, but it's your tactical. Uh, it's a, a more uh, a more modern um folder you might put in your pocket and use as opposed to some of the other things that you make that you might not be as uh red ready to do that with you know safe queens if you will or um but this so it it begs the question you know um art knives are art knives robust you know this one obviously it looks this one looks very robust but what about the real fancy things you make are they still built like tanks Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The first and foremost function comes above anything else. These are, you know, functional pieces of art here. Um, and if they didn't work right, then you, know, you, you kind of miss the first, first base there. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. It's, it's essentially the same thing. Just, um, you know, has, has, um, roots in, in, in the art knife world as well. We bring everything to come together. It really represents, um, our lineage and, and where we come from and where we're going. So when, when we say art knife, I, like, I, I think I know one, when I see one, you know, it's like that old judge. Uh, I know it when I see it, but how do you define an art knife? Does it have to do with the materials or the pr process or, or what? Um, I think it's just a matter of, um, maybe what you're set out to do. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, a different category. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if this would be considered an art knife. You know, this is a, a tactical knife, but it just happens to incorporate mm -hmm. techniques from the art knife world. I guess uh, my question, this is interesting. My question would be, did you do that inlay the same way you did the inlay on your giveaway knife? Yeah, everything we do exactly the same. Well, then it's an art knife. I mean, because uh, to me, like that's... So I mean, I mean, is it a certain level of skill set that goes into it that makes makes an art knife? You know, you were talking about what materials are, are put into it, but most of the most of the um, knives we were making when I first started was it was just simple four sixteen handles, and you know, just plain steel. And then it's just it was a matter of playing with the light almost, you know, to carve and creating different shapes, different textures, um, to create more out of a very very simple canvas so when uh say gearing up for something like blade show and and your father and you i i have a picture of you and your father in my mind like jamming away in the shop how does it work how do you divide the labor uh i mean that's sort of that's sort of grown naturally as i've you know come into my own as a maker i've i've taken over different processes more than others um, he seems he's, he's more responsible for the function of the knives at this point. And I do a lot of the, um, of the, you know, the, the actual building of it, the shaping of the mm -hmm. parts, the fitting of the locks, the grinding, the blades, the finish work, um, things like that. But it's, it's really just a matter. It's, it's a cohesive unit. We've, we've been working together for 10 years now. So we've definitely learned who, uh, can handle what, who does some certain things better. You know, he's, he's getting older and my eyes are, are, are still fresh. So I can look at some things that he does. Maybe I'll go back and, and redo a couple things here and there and vice versa. And it's just kind of a matter of um, just incorporating both of our, our skill sets together. So do you think you've gotten to the point where um, you, you can teach the master some things? <laughs> Uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep it humble. Like I'm not gonna... <laughs> <laughs> grasshopper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you got, you got to imagine, you know, you're like we were saying before, you know, you're, you're coming at it with fresh eyes. You have, uh, the experience of being, you know, a younger man than he is in this era. And, and, um, you, you know, uh, I'm sure your dad has seen many different trends in the folding knife world come and go. And in your 10 years, I know you have. Um, uh, so, but, but you still have those fresher eyes. Well, in terms of trends, do you, do you feel, um, do you, how do you assimilate into your kind of um, 
the rarefied air of the knives you make, how do you, how do you assimilate some of the trends um, in terms of locks or whatever is kind of front flippers, anything like that? How does that get assimilated in? Does it? Uh, well, I think that's kind of the, one of the issues that we, we ran into, you know, moving from, from the art knives, doing flippers, we we're kind of just um, trying to keep up, up with the trends, doing things that are more in demand, reaching different markets. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think at a certain point, we've just realized that we do what we do. And, you know, we, we're, we're a unique entity in our own. We, we have our own experiences. And so, um, you know, we're one of a handful of people in the world that, that make a dual action switchblade. So we're, we're, we're working on that unique factor and definitely continuing to build those. Um, yeah, it's, it's, how do I assimilate? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not really sure. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, I, it's, a uh, could be a hard, our own trends, you know, that's the whole thing with yeah. like, with, with the giveaway, I'm trying something new now. I want to, you know, really should be, do things that are authentic to, to us, to, to me, um, to, you know, do, you know, everyone has their own experience. Everyone has their own idea of what a knife should be um, based off of preference and, and conditioning and, and, and whatever else. And the people who like touch knives, like touch knives for what they are. They're not like, why don't you make me a button lock or, or whatever the, the big thing is at the, right. at the time. We definitely learned over the years. You can't please everyone. You know, we went and tried building flippers. Oh, I want it. I want this. Oh, I'd rather have a, a, a thumb stud or, or, or whatnot. So it really just comes down to, to building what we want to build and, and hoping people appreciate our work. Who's your customer? Who's our customer? Um, well, there's a huge uh, knife community out there that, that appreciates handmade work. Mm, God, that purple is amazing. Oh, yeah. Time ask has turned out great. Wow. Sorry to interrupt you. So, no, you're good. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there's there's definitely a limited number of people that are that are able to actually be a customer of ours, which is another reason uh, for the giveaway is to be able to make that more accessible to the common person. I mean, I look, uh, Jim was scrolling through your Instagram page and some of them I'm like, that's for a collector. That's for a collector. That is for, you know, a, um, you know, someone who knows, but uses their knives, you know, like some of them really do look very, um, pocket friendly others look like you know you want to carry it around on a pillow uh, that's that's why i ask i was wondering if, you know are are they a lot of collectors of your works and of other um of other um uh, art art knife makers um it's curious to me you know because everyone's got a different uh different tastes and different angles on their collections um and you know to have one something like yours uh I wonder what, you know, the water those people swim in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, but the the thing is, is, you know, there's all, obviously there's the ultra rich that have too much money to spend that are looking for something cool to, to you know, mm -hmm. be able to pull out and show off once in a while. But we have a lot of a lot of customers that are just common folks, butchers yeah. and mechanics and and people that just happen to appreciate the work that we do and, and deem it worth spending the money to support our art and, and to own one of, one of our knives. So how have you um, experienced the knife uh, community, the knife world? Um, you know, I know that you go to blade show, but uh, in terms of kind of getting online and, and pre presenting your work on Instagram and other places like that, how have you been received uh, by the knife community? Uh, me personally, or or no, just just touch knives. It, it uh, you know, I I seem to have found you on Instagram, uh, and and to to a lot of people who really love your work. So I'm I'm wondering what it's like operating in 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 that environment. Well, I think the people that that happen to stumble upon our work, um, you know, the, and 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 resonate with it. There's an appreciation there that that is is just like anyone else. You know, people that that run into art and sparks a, 
uh, reactions as well. Wow, that's that that hits home there. Um, I've definitely, I think, struggled a bit in the past to be um, consistent on social m media, and 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 that's been kind of a downfall, especially in in like when when we were doing the art knives, you know, making a dozen or less knives in a year, it's hard to become prolific uh, with that level of production. You know, these guys that, that have 20, 30,000 followers are people that are able to make more knives. And because of that, more owners are posting them. So it expands naturally like that. So that, that has definitely been an obstacle to, to um, maintain that sort of consistency and, and sharing of the work. And um, yeah, and just like bringing people into the shop and, and showing, showing them what, they, what we actually do so that it, it can be appreciated. So when you uh, look down the road for touch knives, what do you see? Um, what do you want the company to become um, as you become the elder, if you will? <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, looking at, at th this, this giveaway idea is, is really the direction that I'd like to head to. I want, I want to be able to get back to really um, pushing my limits as a maker and, and to be able to, <laughs> to thrive doing so rather than, um, you know, trying to make steps towards increasing production um, and, and not lowering quality, but definitely, um, I don't know, there's, there's just a certain different, different level of energy or a different, different feel that comes out of a knife like that rather than one like, like the, the coho here where it's, it was really just a, a fun, you know, it was, it was something that I, you know, it's, I, I like to do things like the the thumb studs on on there with the mother of pearl inlay. That that is kind of just like a joke to me. Like, oh, let's see if I can do that. You know, I don't I don't have a lathe even. That was done on the manual mill and just lining it up, drilling the hole properly, and took a few tries. But you know, when you when it works, it just it makes it makes you light up. It makes you warm. Like I I, I did that. <laughs> it's really cool. So that that's ideally the direction that, that I want to go. I I know. Um, it's in order to do that, to support the art of it, uh, separate from this giveaway idea, it's, it's going to be a matter of, of having production knives, having, you know, like a lot of makers are having Riot make knives, doing, doing EDM work and, um, and, and things like that. We've had a lot of, a lot of demand for, you know, since our little production knife came out, a lot of people are, it's making it clear that they want more of that. Um, but I, ideally, like I, I want this giveaway idea to to really to really work to to make it so. Uh, ideally, I'd I'd be able to make you know a handful of spectacular knives a year and and just just go balls out on it and, and really just put every bit of different skill set that I that I know to be able to show and push my limit to be able to just make incredible you know pieces of art the. I can then give away and, and change someone's life and then in return have that sort of um, abundance that comes through just providing as much value as I possibly can because that's that's essentially what this is. It's I'm giving away a knife and $5,000. That's That represents everything that I have to offer the world right now. <laughs> so, I, you know, I believe in the law of reciprocity. I believe in the more you give, the more you get. And, and that's the... That's sort of the, the motto and the mindset that I have going into this. Well, all those who love touch knives are happy about that. That's a great, uh, that's a great motto. But I would also argue that your idea about the production knives is also in the spirit of a giveaway because there might be plenty of people who really resonate with your aesthetic but are nowhere near, you know, a place in their life where they're going to get one of your knives. Uh, but to be able to have that design in their pocket for a couple hundred bucks from Riot, one of the the greatest, if not the you know arguably the greatest production company in China, um, you know, or or anywhere, that is also generous because um, you know you could just be laboring away on these exquisite art knives and never give anyone the chance to own them. Um, that giveaway is amazing, of course. Who wouldn't want the real deal with five grand? Uh, but also, oh, well, you know, next year, maybe they're going to put out a small batch of touch knives uh, that that I, I can, you know, I can still have that design. It won't have all of the 
flourishes and all the art to it, but it will have that the spirit of the design. Yeah, yeah and the spirit of it. Yeah, absolutely. That is one thing that I love about uh, the 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 current you know design OEM paradigm is just being able to own things by people that I just can't you know that's just totally out of reach. Or if you're someone like me and you have a a, a very diverse appetite uh, for your collection and you, you're not going to spend too much in any particular place because you want to try a whole bunch of different things, that's another thing. You know, I could probably sell my whole collection and buy one of your knives. But I'd, I'd like to assimilate your design, you know, via Riot into my, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like the idea. Keep going with the, the production. It, and, but that it all has the same spirit, you know. You give, yeah. You make it more accessible, you know, be, be able to really give more than, uh, than, than what is normally allotted based off of um, how we have done things leading up to now. Just one practical question about this, though. Does that mean that you give one away a year? Are you right? Or if, no, if you're... I'm looking at doing it, you know, when one ends, you start the next one, you know, working through because, you know, how do you make way... money that way? Uh, well, by people buying merch. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Spending oh, money oh, on the I merch. That, oh, that's how it works. You, know, you, you spend a certain, you know, you buy a $60. Um, sweatshirt, then you get you get sixty entries and winning the knife. It's it's essentially like a, a raffle on you know on steroids with with more payoff, potential payoff, and and you know relative to the guys that are doing this with like I've seen Lamborghinis and fifty thousand dollars cash, like this I is done on such a smaller scale. The 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 like odds of winning are so much higher. It's it's something where I realized. You know, I've I've seen these guys doing it with cars, and and it's always been wow, that's a great idea. I'm not going to enter in their things because off that, like I know they're getting millions and millions of entries, you know, going to a, a corporation without really a face on it. Uh, you know, this is taking that concept, but it's taking it to like the level of a mom pop or, you know, or, or father son business. Okay. Okay. I finally get it. Like the full picture, the <laughs> full picture. Now. All right. Uh, I get it. I get it. Um, that's cool. <laughs> I'll be buying a sweatshirt. <laughs> No, okay, that's cool. But like you said, to keep that's, it that's legal, what we need to make this happen as people, you know, it's a, it's a, it's like a compound effect, and it takes an yeah. arm to make this sort of, this sort of thing work. Okay, but as you also mentioned, uh, it uh, purchase is not required, and and right. you just go to the website and check and check it all out. Mm -hmm. um, but all those details, Eric. I want to thank you so much for coming on and 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 uh, for being so. Uh, welcoming at blade show and and you know because you let me pick up everything that you had there and it was all you know so that's what it's all about it's, i know, know i know but i was like man I, you don't know how many shows. i want to show off what i did i'm proud of the work that you know that we do i want i want people to handle it to appreciate it see their eyes light up when they you realize what you know there's there's a spring in there oh my you know people yeah. pick up the knives and they'll look through it and they say man this is amazing this is great and then they realize what else is going on. And then it's like, wow. So that's like, it, that's, that's the, the thing that really makes it worth it. It's the appreciation from the people that really love what we do. Absolutely. I'm just glad I didn't drop them. You don't know how many knives I drop, Eric. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, great talking to you. And do go to, uh, go to touchknives.com and check out the giveaway. Uh, this is giveaway number one, and Eric is starting something new, and this is a really cool idea and a great way to get uh, a, a real piece of artwork in your collection. So, Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Touch of Touch Knives. I love a uh, a family knife story, as you know, and father-son, that takes the cake. Uh, very, very amazing knives. I do recommend you check them out on Instagram. And if you have the means, I highly recommend you pick up a folder by them. Um, but uh, really 
check out the uh, that giveaway. And it, it is interesting to see uh, that is a knife that he made completely. Eric made completely soup to nuts on his own, including the design. It's also cool to see the the designs they work on together. And uh, and you can do that by going to their website, touchknives.com. Uh, be sure to check in with us next Sunday for a, another great conversation. Uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live on YouTube. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.